it's on the cloud. Okay. So yes, um, so this session will be recorded um, so, and I will make sure you, act, you have access to it as soon as possible um, so that you can, if you can't do the demo part um, in real time today, you can actually do it on your own. Uh, please make sure that you are muted and your video is disabled. That, you know, that'll help us. Um, uh, the muting will help us with any external noises people may have. And, uh, and then obviously the, the video is for possible um, um, bandwidth issues that may, may arise. Um, <clears throat> so I will encourage you to pose your questions on the chat. There will be some time for questions. I will try to answer them during the, the question period. And then during the interactive session, um, Bonnie and Kubra, who are volunteering to help today, um, will be answering the questions that you post in the chat. And uh, if there's something, is there some question that you need to uh, actually talk to them, we can, we have created two breakout rooms. Um, and then these, you can actually go to these rooms and ask them to just ask any one of them to join you. And then hopefully, they, you know, you can get um, any problem uh, sorted out. Uh, but yeah, let's try to keep everything um, in the main chat so that because if you have to, if you have to go to the breakout room, then you miss what's going on in the main session, right? Um, okay, so uh, let's get started. Um, I before I forget, I want to thank the Department of Energy for funding, um, NSERC, Exceed, and Advanced Research Computer at U of M uh, for computational resources, uh, and also I would like to uh, thank some people. Uh, that have con uh, contributed or helped in the development of Prisons PF. Um, I will start with Katsuya Thornton, who is the head uh, of the Faith Field Development of the Prison Center. And I also want to uh, mention that I took uh, quite a bit of the material from her lecture, um, which I will also share on the link that I will send um, in the next hour. Um, <clears throat> and John Allison, who is the director of the Prison Center. And then I also want to thank people uh, who have been involved in the features uh, or applications of Prisons PF, uh, starting with two major contributors, uh, Shiva Rudrajaju. Oh, I'm sorry, Shiva, Shiva Rudrajaju, uh, who is now at the uh, University of Wisconsin Medicine. Uh, he started the framework, and um, also Steve Dewitt, now at the Oak Ridge National Lab, who developed many of its current uh, functionalities. Um, uh, some developers from uh, U of M, current developers and past developers, Yan Jun Liu, uh, Shen Jie Yao, Beck Andrews, uh, and uh, uh, Brian Kinzer. And from other institut institutions, we have um, Kubra, Karayaji, and Bonnie Whitney for, from WPI, Nicole Schumann and Susan Gentry from UC Davis. Pushkar Pandit from the Indian Institute of Technology in Hyderabad, uh, Tom Flint from University of Manchester, and Chan Yui Liu from uh, Southern University of Science and Technology in China. Um, finally, I want to give special thanks to Bonnie Whitney, Brian Kinzer, and Akubar Karayaji for helping, uh, um, for volunteering to help in the sessions. Okay, let's start with the phase field method. Um, but let's take a big step back um, and look at uh, where this model fits within the paradigm of material science. So the goal of material science uh, and engineering is to improve existing materials or develop novel uh, materials performance by understanding the relationship between processing, structure, properties, and performance. So processing alters the atomic structure and microstructure of materials. And then structure determines the properties of these materials. And some properties are desirable and improve the performance of materials and others are, are not, right? So for example, here's a microstructure uh, on the top right of an alloy used in a turbine blade of an airplane. As you can imagine, this material is subject to continuous high stress and very high temperatures. So it needs to be creep resistant in order, creep -resistant in order to withstand these conditions. And it turns out that having these squared shape um, particles that you can see, well, kind of square, kind of between square and round, 
um, uh, it, it's, uh, is what makes this material um, so resistant to the deformation. So we need to be able to design a process that gives you this microstructure. And in order to do that, we need to understand the underlying mechanisms involved in the formation of this array of precipitates in this case, right? So this is where uh, phase field models comes in. Um, in essence, a phase field model is a method to simulate a microstructure evolution and in particular, the evolution of interfaces and compositions of different constituents in a material. These simulations help us understand the underlying mechanisms that give rise to different microstructures. So being able to predict microstructural evolution is a powerful tool in the design process that will give us a set of desired properties and performance. So let me give you some examples. Um, these are all examples. I'm, I'm sure going to show a few examples, and these are all obtained. Um, these are all PRISM's PF uh, simulations. Let's start with grain growth, which is a process that occurs typically in a solid um, metal or alloy. And it's driven by the reduction uh, of internal energy, which is achieved by decreasing the total area of grain boundaries, which, you, as you can see, are these uh, dark regions. Uh, each of these grains are single crystals. And uh, the grain boundaries separate uh, crystals of different orientations. This is a very commonly observed phenomenon in materials. Um, uh, another um, interesting uh, phenomenon is um, alloy solidification. This is a typical of what happens in a casting process. Um, what happens here is that an instability, as, as solidification occurs, an instability um, happens at the solid liquid interface. And this gives right, um, so the, the red regions are is a solid and the white region is a liquid. So the solid is growing into the liquid. Uh, and this instability gives rise to this dendritic structure, this kind of branches that you see uh, emanating from uh, the solid. The figure of the left is actually a four uh, dimensional, that means three dimensions in space and one in time, um, X-ray computed tomography from an actual dendritic growth experiment. So as you can see, this is pretty good, um, at least as at least can, we can see here, qualitative agreement between what the simulation uh, is predicting and uh, what, actually what is actually happening. Um, and then um, the simulation in the square, in the box uh, is the dendritic, which has happened, sorry, it's uh, Equiax, which has happened at constant, uh, uniform temperature and the one below is directional, which happens when you have a temperature gradient and constant cooling. Let me show you another one. Uh, this is for corrosion. What we're seeing here is the surface of a metal, which in this case is pure magnesium. And part of the surface is also occupied by an iron particle. And the top surface is in contact with an electrolyte, uh, which you can't see in this, in this uh, image but you, know, you can assume that it's there. Um, and what we're showing here is an example of microgalvanic corrosion in which uh, the more noble metal, when, which in this is iron in this case, is acting as a cathode and magnesium is acting as an anode, uh, which is the material that is actually corroding. The, met the metal is dissolving into the electrolyte. And that's why we observe uh, this microgalvanic effect is why we observe the corrosion front to move faster close to the iron particle. And uh, you know, these are a few uh, other examples that we've simulated or other uh, you know, uh, people have simulated using Prism's PF. Uh, starting from top left, we have spinodal decomposition and coarsening, uh, nucleation and growth of particles, um, evolution on uh, top and bottom left, we have um, evolution of uh, particles with strong interfacial anisotropy uh, that have evolved from an initially spher spherical shape. And the reason they have different shapes is because each particle has a different form of the anisotropy function. And on the bottom right, we show a simulation of uh, the interaction between magnesium and neodymium precipitates. And this like figure also shows a pretty good agreement with the experiments in terms of uh, morphology and relative orientation, as you can see from the experimental um, image. Um, okay, so again, let's, and now let's go back again to uh, phase field model. So what's the idea behind the phase field model? So 
To model microstructure evolution, we need a method to describe and track interfaces. If we treat interfaces as sharp two-dimensional surfaces, the interface location must be tracked by markers. Uh, and this is called the sharp, inter, um, sharp uh, interface model. Uh, and then the problem with this is that it's typically very challenging to solve numerically because it is math mathematically and, num and numerically expensive uh, to compute the positions of these markers. Um, so instead of that, the idea of uh, phase field is that uh, it considers a diffuse interface that is thin, but it's not completely sharp. The interface is the region that occupies a small volume um, where quantities change gradually between two bulk values. And then uh, bulk quantities are, are governed by partial differential equations. Um, and interfaces can be identified as the region where bulk quantities take their interfacial values. So the big advantage here is that the same partial differential equation can be applied everywhere, including the interface regions. And that eliminates the need for explicitly tracking the interfaces. So we know where the interface is, you know, when we analyze the results, but we don't have to know where the interface or the, the code it doesn't need to know where the interface is as it's as it's um, as it's finding the, the solution, um, the evolution over time. Um, and the, then let's talk about order parameters. Um, so the evolution of interfaces is characterized by, uh, by using order parameters. So an order parameter is simply a continuous field that characterizes this, each face uh, as well as the interface. Each order parameter uh, has a governing equation, um, which is a partial differential equation associated with it. And order parameters class can be classified as conserved or non-conserved. For example, uh, on the picture there on the left side, we are showing an order disorder transition that is characterized by a non-conserved order parameter. And on the right side, we have an example of spinodal decomposition, which is characterized by a conserved order parameter. Um, uh, OK, so what determines uh, microstructural evolution? Well, the short answer is uh, both thermodynamics and kinetics. So the evolution, the equilibrium state uh, in any system is a state for which the free energy is a minimum. This is kind of just the basic thermodynamics. Um, so for both, both phases, the state can be determined using phase diagrams and it's characterized by a, a, a uniform chemical potential. So uh, systems featuring complex microstructures observing materials are not really in thermodynamic equilibrium. However, their evolution is still driven by the minimization of free energy. And the driving force for this phase transformation is proportional to the gradient of the chemical potential. Um, but there is a kinetic factor also that determines how fast that this transformation uh, can occur. Um, okay, so how can we kind of write that and how can we actually describe that using uh, some, something useful like math? Um, for example, if we have a system for which different phases are characterized by uh, different equilibrium compositions, we can define an order parameter that depends linearly on that composition. That is how you know, this phi is described in there. So suppose that we have, uh, that we can write a free energy expression um, of for the whole system that depends on this value of phi which varies in general, it varies spatially. Then the chemical potential is defined as the variational derivative uh, of this free energy with respect to phi. Okay. Now, if you remember uh, the form for the diffusion equation, we have a flux that is proportional to a concentration gradient. But now we can generalize it as a chemical potential gradient uh, with M being uh, a mobility instead of diffusivity. Then we can combine this expression uh, with an expression for mass conservation, which is the second line. And then the expression for chemical potential from the last slide. And if we combine them all, uh, we arrive at the can hilliard expression, which is almost identical to the diffusion equation, but uh, we have, uh, 
uh, gradient of mu, as you can see, uh, instead of gradient of C. By the way, uh, I'm not going to do that right now, but you can actually prove that for a bulk phase, the can Hiller equation just becomes the diffusion equation. Okay, so uh, what am I missing? What are we still missing? Uh, what else do we need? Um, what we need is an expression for the free energy, right? We haven't really talked about that. Uh, I just said we, we can assume that we have one. So um, how, do we, how do we build it? The simplest approximation for the free energy of the system contains two terms. Uh, the first one considers the energy from a homogeneous phase as a function of concentration. And you can get that from a thermodynamic database like thermocalc. By the way, I just noticed that uh, this term is uh, written in terms of C, not phi, but just consider, you know, from now on, we, we're going to just write C. And then this, this C means uh, rescale concentration. Um, and uh, in practice, uh, usually a simple polynomial approximation is a good enough approx is, a, is good enough to approximate this form, and this form is uh, usually call, uh, called a double well. Um, the second contribution um, is uh, effectively a penalty for having a sharp gradient, so it forces the interface to be smooth. Um, and also notice that this term increases as the area interface increases because you know it, it's the interface is the integral over the whole volume. So if you have more interfacial area, you're going to have this term is always positive. So um, the more interfacial area, the, the bigger this contribution will be. Uh, so it's expected uh, from uh, what you would expect from the thermodynamics, right? Um, uh, interfaces cost energy. Um, um, so we go back to the can Hiller equation for the dynamics. And now we can uh, obtain, because now we have an expression for that, we can obtain the variational derivative uh, from the free energy expression um, and solve the equation numerically. Uh, and this is, this is the result of the variational derivative, um, which is not uh, complicated to obtain if you use uh, a bit of a um, variational calculus. Um, um, okay, so let's move on. Um, now, if we consider um, the same form for the free energy, but for a non-conserved order parameter, we get the allen kahn equation, which is even simpler. The only difference here is that since the order parameter is not conserved, the local time derivative of the order parameter will which simply be proportional uh, to the chemical potential, which is what we are seeing here in the, in the last line. And this equation gives us the, fast, the fastest path uh, to minimize the global free energy without, having to, without being to any um, conservation loss. I should also mention that the can Hiller equation uh, describes phenomena where dynamics are, are uh, typically describes phenomena where dynamics are conserved, are, sorry, are governed by main curvature at interfaces. So this is uh, typically things like disorder disorder transition in binary alloys. And actually the first stimulation I show, grain growth, um, except in that example, you use uh, different more, uh, order parameters, uh, one for each grain. So um, it can be more complex systems, but the, the physics uh, are basically not that complicated. Um, <clears throat> Okay, so we've kind of covered the basis of the basics of phase field model. Uh, we're going to revisit uh, uh, this later today, but with an emphasis on numerical solution of the equations. But for now, I would like to mention that uh, most phase field formulations employ the governing equations we've covered today to describe the evolution of the order parameters. And depending on the system we want to study, we can incorporate different physics. Um, uh, into the free energy. And by this, I mean uh, things like elasticity, um, interaction between uh, different order parameters, interaction with an external electric or magnetic field, uh, and many others. Um, but the governing equations are uh, derived using the same method. You have a free energy, you uh, postulate uh, evolution of each parameter, depending on whether it's conserved or non-conserved. And uh, you have you take the variational derivative of the free energy with respect to all uh, degrees of freedom or order parameters that you define. 
Um, and also many applications of the phase field models require multiple order parameters that need to be solved simultaneously. Um, for example, the alloy solidification uh, requires the solution of the coupled can Hillier and Allen can dynamics. Okay, so um, this is a good time. Uh, so let's let's see if, if there's some any questions about um, what I just talked. Let me go open the chat. I don't see anyone answer question ask questions. Uh, but yeah, maybe let's. Uh, if you want to, you can raise your hand. And since we have some time, um, just feel free to to un, you know, maybe raise your hand and then unmute or, or unmute yourself and um, ask any question. If you can unmute yourself, actually, I'm not sure. But if you raise your hand, I'll, know, I'll see and uh, I'll unmute you. Or, or you can post in the chat, okay. So it seems that Alan Can and Count Hillier are similar, right? Um, yeah, so again, the difference is whether, um, yeah, Okay, so the similarity is, so the similarity in Can Hillier, in the Can Hillier equation, um, the free energy functional is identical to the Allen Can, uh, but the only difference is the dynamics, right? So in Can Hillier, you have this dynamics third line here, um, and this is this means that the change of concentration at every point of the system um, will be such that the energy uh, will be driven to a minimum, but subject to conservation laws. So that means that you can't basically, in a way you sort of, you can't create or, or destroy any mass of the system. So it's conserved. And so that conservation is given by this uh, divergence of mobility. So basically these gradients are what ensure, ensure this conservation, right? So this is the same, the same uh, form of uh, the diffusion equation. And in the Allen can, uh, the dynamics basic, sorry, in the, yeah, in the Allen can, the dynamics just tells you, um, I don't care about anything that's conserved, just give me the fastest you can towards the minimum. Uh, okay, so somebody's asking, how do you solve six and, and eight order problems in Prisons PF using mix, mix, mix formulation? Uh, yeah, so the, you know, the, you're, we're getting a little bit ahead, but I'll talk about this later. But yes, in order to uh, solve um, problems that are higher order, um, it's usually convenient to do split, to split up the equation so we don't have high order derivatives. Um, thank you, Jenkin. But uh, let's talk about this a little bit later. Um, how do we include orientation evolutions uh, in the basic uh, phase, uh, phase field equation? So um, you mean orientation uh, of different grains? Um, I'm guessing, yeah. So um, as long as you include a term in the free energy, so I'm not sure if you're thinking about like a single grain uh, that changes orientation, or you're talking about the effect of orientation in grain boundaries. Um, ooh, yes, grain growth. Uh, but are you saying that our orientations change uh, in the course of time or orientations if affect how um, different grains growth? That's what I kind of want to know. Um, maybe you can unmute him. Yeah, maybe let's, yeah. So that then it's more conversation. Yeah, that's a good idea. As to unmute, okay, Reza. So, sorry, David. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, like uh, what you mentioned is all based on thermodynamics and diffusion. Yes. If I want to include like the change of orientation during grain growth, okay. which orientation is dominant? Where do I incorporate that into the basic Kahn-Hiller equation? Um, I, so, so let me just every, uh, ask, be, be very clear. So, when you say change orientation, do you mean change of uh, texture, or do you mean yeah, texture? Thanks. Oh, I see. So, yeah. So, what you can do is you can you can just kind of set set orientations for each grain, right? And then the grains that grow 
for instance, in recrystallization, the grains that grow faster, that will become the dominant orientation. So it's still thermodynamics. Um, you can make this, uh, you can make uh, also grain boundaries. Uh, um, you know, that, again, this is kind of a little bit uh, of a complex problem because we, we also, for instance, have uh, the effect of dislocations, right? So grains with, typically grains with uh, high dislocation density will uh, uh, disappear and then um, they will shrink at the expense of, um, or rather, grain, uh, grain, um, grains with low dislocation density will grow at the expense of uh, grains with uh, high dislocation density. So whatever orientation these new grains have, uh, the, the orientation of the grains that prevail, that's what will determine the texture. So that's the same physics. You don't have to kind of add anything to it. I don't know if that's kind of, um, everything can be added into the uh, free energy. Okay, so everything will be adjusted into the free energy. Exactly, exactly. So this is a very, very simple case of free energy expression. In general, for instance, this uh, K factor that's multiplying the gradient of order parameter, when for grain growth, we'll have basically different order parameters each for, you know, for each grain. And then uh, this will in general be an, an isotropic, you know, you can make it depend on um, the misorientation between um, two grains in the grain boundary. Okay, okay. thanks. Yeah, thanks. Um, ooh, there's a lot of questions. Let's try to see. Um, do we need to fit the Gibbs energy in case, the Gibbs free energy in case of a multi-component alloy? Yes. That's the idea. When we have multi-component alloy, you can have um, Gibbs free energy curves, um, and then you can fit those free energies into the um, into the main free energy. You have one kind of, one kind of master free energy for the whole system, and then you can um, interpolate. You can create it in a way that each phase has a different equilibrium composition. Um, but yes, essentially yes. You you put in those free energy curves into the into the free into the free energy. The kappa value. How do, how should we think when in defining it? Um, so I am actually not uh, going to go into this, but you can actually relate the kappa value. So if you can see, I have two constants here, kappa and w, and these constants can actually be related to the interfacial energy, and then I can actually also set a um, I'm free to choose, more or less free to choose uh, an interface thickness that is small enough uh, to describe the system um, so that uh, all relevant length scale, so that it's uh, sufficiently small compared to all other relevant length scales that, that occur during the evolution. So you can, you can actually, I didn't, I, because this is a, just a very brief overview, I didn't include that, but in the lectures, um, in the lectures from Professor Thornton, um, there is a way to, it, it, it's a, there's an explicit uh, uh, expression where you can use to, to set these values. And then you, you would relate them to the interfacial energy and the interface thickness. Um, how to get essential data from thermocalc gate database. So yes, you can, if you can get a free energy curves from thermocalc, you would just insert them into, you can have polynomial, polynomial approximations to this uh, free energy curves and then plug it into that free energy. Uh, all right, I'll answer two more questions and then, um, yeah, I'm sorry, just there's, a, there's many people. So how do you handle free energy in the unstable region of the free energy functional um, in prisons PF? Um, stable region of the free energy functional. I'm not sure what that question means. So you mean kind of the, if you are in this kind of, uh, uh, in, in this kind of, uh, 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 between, between these two uh, energy valleys, 
I'm sorry. You can maybe, I mean, I, I don't know. I don't know exactly what you mean. We can maybe, let's, let's pencil that question towards, um, towards the end and uh, uh, yeah. I want to simulate a problem that is that a particle will be dissolved, but thermocalc has no diffusion information such as mobility, how to do it. Uh, yes, so you have to find other uh, mobility values um, from the literature. Usually, yeah, unfortunately these, sometimes it's, uh, this information is tricky. You would, um, you would have, Katsuya, do you have any input on how, where to find mobilities in general? Is that a good resource? Are you asking me or? Yes, I'm yes, sorry. Yeah. sorry. Um, well, if it's not available in the literature, then, then you have to start with the uh, approximate value and uh, uh, maybe math the experiment. Yeah. So, so that's actually, key, um, sorry. You can do key experiments to, to you know, try to math, uh, to try to extract that information. Yeah. All right, thank you for that input. Yes, so 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 you can I can be like a posteriori, like you 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 suppose some you you assume some ability, you do your simulation, and then you compare with experiments and see you know if they match, you probably have a good a good a good uh, approximation. Um, okay, I'm gonna sorry, I'm gonna have to. Um, yeah, interfacial energies are hard to get even by atomistic models. That is true. Um, and then it's kind of the same. You have to sort of get an estimate and then see if you can reproduce experimental results. Um, OK. Uh, and then, oh, I see because you had commented that you have a paper on the subject. And uh, thank you for sharing it. I will share it at the end of the session. All right. Um, however, let's, let's move on. Uh, I'm sorry if I didn't have to, uh, time to answer your question. I'd be glad to answer questions at the end of the session. Uh, I will stick around for a little longer and hopefully I can answer all the questions. All right, let's keep going. I'm gonna close the participants in the chat so I can see my notes. All right, now let's talk about the PRISMS PF framework. Um, this is for the first part, it's gonna be a bit of a commercial for this framework. And I wanna try to convince you uh, to use it uh, because it has many advantages and hopefully yeah, you will be convinced of this at the end of the, at the end of this section. Um, and then I'm gonna transition from that into uh, um, how to actually use it um, and, and what is the structure of the code. Um, first, um, I want to situate uh, this work uh, within the, again, this, if you were in the workshop, you probably already seen this. And I actually gave a talk that's very similar, but I wanna repeat this for those of you who weren't um, on the workshop. Um, so I would like to show how this uh, uh, work fits within the PRISM Center integrated framework. Um, as you can see, facial simulations are central to this framework uh, since they require thermodynamic and kinetic data uh, that experiments or atomistic models can provide. And we can use them to predict microstructure evolution, which in turn uh, can be useful for experiments and other computational tools uh, such as uh, chasms or um, Sorry, such as a crystal plasticity finite element. Um, okay. Um, uh, let's talk about some uh, motivation uh, behind the development of uh, Prisons PF. So, what is uh, so difficult? What are the challenges of writing a, a phase field code? Um, so, first of all, phase field models have a wide range of applications in simulating microstructure. Um, so I'm just showing a few phenomena here, uh, a few examples here. And if you, one thing that you can actually tell is that these systems don't really have much in common with each other. Um, and the reason is that there's really no typical governing equation for all uh, faithful models. All of these examples are uh, just describing very different physics. They're very different. They're governed by uh, very, very different phenomena. Uh, so governing equations need to be selected on a case-by-case -case basis. 
Um, and then these, this, this depends on the physics that we want to describe. And as a consequence, we have a large, large variety of formulations and terms. So a challenge for a framework is that it needs to be flexible enough to incorporate different uh, governing equations. That is one challenge. But another challenge is that simulating large physically representative systems um, is almost always computationally intensive, typically requiring tens of thousands of cores. Uh, sorry, between tens or up to thousands of cores. <laughs> Uh, because of this, uh, many studies are often done in two, dimension, uh, two dimensions for uh, tractability. But if we want to do some uh, serious science um, and have accurate three-dimensional simulations, we require strong computational performance um, and fidelity. And this is why uh, it is essential to have a scalable, high-performance framework uh, uh, that can perform uh, large simulations of complex microstructure uh, in, um, and that is uh, parallel and scalable. Um, okay, so given these challenges, uh, the PRISM3 uh, uh, framework uh, was designed under four guiding principles. First of all, that it's computational performance, including parallel scalability. Uh, either meets or exceeds that of typical phase field codes, as well as uh, some of the most common open source codes. Second, uh, that it accommodates a wide variety of phase field models and applications. Uh, third, that the interface for creating or modifying governing equations is simple, quick, and separate from the numerical implementation. And finally, that it is open source with a permissive license, so it is available to everyone, and advances uh, can be shared by the community. Let's go over some of the main features and capabilities of this framework. Uh, first of all, I want you to show the, on the uh, top left, uh, we have a link to the website um, where you can get an overview, access the repository and structure manual. So all relevant links are inside that link. Uh, so in the, left in the left panel, we have some of the advanced capabilities, uh, which include the use of a free matrix approach, which employs an efficient explicit time stepping method by uh, eliminating the need to diagnose a mass matrix, the capability uh, to solve for an arbitrary number of partial differential equations, uh, option to use linear, quadratic, or cubic elements, multi-level parallelism, adaptive meshing, um, explicit nucleus placement, um, grain remapping. These two, uh, this last grain remapping method is uh, very handy for uh, doing uh, large grain growth simulations uh, with uh, just a few order parameters. A Newton Picard solver to solve for nonlinear equations, um, either as their evolution in time or uh, just equilibrium solutions. Um, and then uh, most, most recently, a, um, an implicit time, implicit time integration capability, uh, which will be coming soon. And then and this capability will allow us to solve um, problems for which the time step uh, of, the, of the explicit method is limited uh, due to the high nonlinearity of the uh, partial differential equations. So <clears throat> on the right panel, we have uh, some of the functionalities uh, and ease of use, um, which include a simple interface, uh, detail, detailed online user guide, 27 pre-built applications um, describing a wide variety of different phenomena, uh, simple Docker-based uh, installation, uh, NanoHub tool uh, with uh, GUI for educational use, um, integration with Materials Commons repository for data sharing, um, post-processing scripts for results analysis, and a, uh, also recently um, those two, those last two are recent features and a series of YouTube video tutorials. And all of this work um, uh, was published. We published it. Uh, last year, and, and then you can look at this paper here. So, sorry, this paper right here. Um, let's talk a little bit about the performance. Um, first of all, I want to talk uh, the performance compared to a finite difference code. So you have, um, you know, we, we, we set up a, a simple system of two growing particles in three dimensions, and we had a Fortran finite difference code uh, that was MPI parallelized with second order central difference derivatives and explicit time stepping. 
Um, and then we compare that to PRISMS PF. And uh, if we have, uh, you know, just a linear uh, element uh, and a regular mesh, I find our differences much faster. But then as soon as we get to quadratic elements um, using the same regular mesh, then the performance is comparable. As you can see, the speed up here is 0.9. Uh, but once we get to cubic uh, elements and adaptive mesh, you know, the, comp the, comp the performance of Prisons PF is, you know, oh, an order of magnitude, over an order of magnitude faster, right? So um, that's actually pretty good um, uh, for a, a code that's not custom built. Uh, and then I want to show some comparison uh, to other codes. Uh, this is for a solidification benchmark problem um, developed uh, by the PF Hub community. Um, and you can find it at this link. Um, this is um, an example of dendritic solidification for, for pure material. And we found the performance compared to, we found that the performance uh, was comparable to Moose. Uh, for uh, calculations with the same computational cost and tip velocity error. And uh, much, much faster than other um, open source uh, codes such as AMP and PyPy, having similar or lower error. Um, very briefly, I'm going to mention some uh, new and upcoming features, uh, some recently built in applications. We have one for corrosion, one for spinal decomposition, one for aleph solidification, uh, which I already showed before. Uh, coming soon, we have that microgalvanic corrosion one. Uh, we have one for uh, grain growth with stored energy. Uh, we have a martensitic transformation one. That, that one was being developed by Pushkar uh, Panet and Bonnie Whitney. Um, and it's looking really good. Uh, hope we, hopefully we can release it soon. Um, and then we have some, a series of YouTube video tutorials, one for installing and visualizing results. I highly recommend that you actually look at this video because it's uh, very similar to what I'm gonna talk uh, on the second half of this, uh, of today. Uh, one for uh, installation of prerequisites. Uh, with an example where I show a uh, I set up a nucleation and growth problem again. And the, in these tutorials, what, I do, what I'm doing or um, what we're trying to do is uh, show how to modify the code in order to do specific things. So it's, it's a bit of like trying to uh, users to see and learn by example. Uh, then one for spinodal decomposition and uh, we'll have one for um, uh, modifying the corrosion application coming soon. Uh, and then this one has, you know, the, 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 the newer ones uh, are dealing with uh, increasing level of complexities and uh, things to do with the, in the, in the, in the code um, so that you, users can uh, feel comfortable of using, of, of doing more and more complex things. Um, some other, uh, another uh, of another reason and upcoming features uh, include integration tools. And these are tools that um, help integrate um, Christmas PF with other computational packages. Um, we have an integration, we have integration with Dream 3D, which was recently, we recently upgraded the scripts to import microstructure. Um, we have post-processing uh, post -processing scripts for results analysis. So for instance, if you get, um, if you get your output files, you can just use these scripts to right away calculate, say, phase fraction, um, interfacial area, total interfacial area, the uh, domain counts, uh, and then there's uh, more to come. And then the materials come on CLI. This is this was not directly a development of uh, Prisons PF, but it was something that was uh, that uh, Materials Commons developer, uh, developers released uh, recently. And this allows uh, for very easy input, uh, 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 um, uploading and downloading data, uh, creating projects, um, publishing data sets, and editing communities of, of practice. And I uh, strongly encourage you to um, attend the, 
the a materials commons um, training session as well, given by Agbling Tercia. Um, real quick, I want to talk about the NanoHub module. Uh, so this is a module uh, to calculate the equilibrium shape for mis misfitting precipitate. Um, so what we do is we have we start from a um, spherical shape, and then this mo uh, module calculates uh, the 2D equilibrium shape or precipitate, taking into account the effects of interfacial and strain energy. And this is targeted for classroom use. And it was recently upgraded uh, to include a low fidelity option so that it produces a faster preliminary calculation uh, that gives uh, a good qualitative um, uh, fidelity or you know, good qualitative results. <clears throat> OK. Um, and then uh, for ongoing development, we have a, oh, your, sure. excuse me? Oh, can everybody mute themselves? Unless there's something that needs to be. OK. Um, so uh, we're developing a static recrystallization application as well, um, uh, yeah, which will be coupled with prisons plasticity. Um, then externally, we have two exciting developments, one uh, for additive manufacturing by Tom Flint and Brian Kinsner and Bonnie Whitney, and then uh, one for fluid dynamics uh, by Shanjie uh, Liu. Um, in terms of performance improvement, um, we are planning to uh, do um, an implementation of GPU acceleration capability. Um, um, we are, um, have the option to use adaptive time stepping, and these are all planned. And then um, also to have the capability of having non zero Neumann boundary conditions. Uh, and then for integration of ease of use, we are planning to do integration of thermocalc for direct access to databases that contain thermodynamic and kinetic information, and integration with CASM as well for loading free energy surfaces. Um, and also adding integration to the, uh, adding an upgrade to the NanoHub tool, which includes integration to materials commons and expanding the post-processing suite uh, to have more scripts that calculate different properties. Okay. Um, for community support, we have an uh, online user's manual, um, which hopefully has, you know, it's, it's extensive and, uh, we're currently up, we're continuously updating and includes uh, things as installation instructions, a detailed uh, explanation of all the parameters uh, that can be used for the parameters file, all the settings, um, some examples on how to write governing equations, and uh, you know, basically the, the main reference guide. Um, we have an online board, online message board with over 100 uh, research registered users. I'm also I also would like to encourage you to register. Uh, then you can ask questions, and uh, uh, myself or someone else uh, who feels comfortable with uh, Prisons PF can answer. And uh, you know, it's a very active board. And then we have uh, recently a uh, phase field community practice, uh, which are uh, it consists of data sets. Um, of phase field results uh, that can be either published or not published in, a, in an article. Uh, but this community of practice are as uh, useful to have uh, basically a compilation of results um, where they can be shared with uh, the phase field community. So you're encouraged to have a look at that as well. Um, OK. Let's now talk a little bit about the code and I'm gonna go into that now. Um, so we have um, three types of Prisons PF users. Um, so you may be able to just use the pre-built applications, for instance, for demonstration purposes, or if you want, uh, you know, we want to simulate something that is almost exactly the same as what it's already there. Uh, you can just modify some parameters, boundary conditions, social conditions, and then you're all set. And then for that, you don't really need to know um, C++ or DL2. Sorry, I hadn't talked about DL2. DL2 is the underlying finite element library 
on, on which uh, Prisons PS, PF is based on. Um, so we're creating new applications. Uh, you need to implement or modify uh, some governing equations and define model parameters. So you need a little bit of knowledge of C++, uh, but really no, no knowledge of DL2. Uh, however, if you want to uh, contribute developing new features and functionalities, then you need to edit the core library. And uh, you know you need to know a little bit of C++. Um, um, but actually, I have mentioned here the core library and the applications, and that actually brings me to the next slide, uh, which is the structure of the code. So the structure of Prisons BF is it contains a core library, which is sort of the, the section where uh, all the finite element calculations, uh, or kind of all the background work is done, uh, calculating, um, updating all the equations, uh, generating output files, uh, reading the, the boundary conditions, all the adaptive mesh, everything is done kind of in the background. And then you only need to compile this library once and then you kind of forget about it. Uh, and then, you know, the, the user, the average user will just interact with the applications, right? And then each application uh, is a directory that contains an input file and some application files. And uh, again, we're gonna go into the interactive sessions and I'm gonna go to these files in detail. Uh, but this is where you can set the governing equations, boundary conditions, initial conditions, numerical and uh, model parameters, and post-processing -pro post expressions. Um, so using an app requires, uh, again, as, as I mentioned before, it requires no C++ experience. Uh, developing an app requires minimal C++ experience and virtually no finite element experience. Um, <clears throat> And then we have a test of uh, a um, suite of test unit and regression tests and uh, continuous integration tested with Travis CI, which ensures that um, um, uh, continuity between uh, different versions um, is smooth. Okay, so let's go a little, do a little bit, let's go uh, one level deeper and see what the um, application uh, files contain. So, all code, uh, all applications must contain these files. So this is uh, main, main CC is just basically the, the, you know, usually in C++, any main code is very, very small. And it just, just does kind of like the main, um, it takes care of the main tasks, uh, but in a very general level, it parses the input data, builds the fields, loads initial conditions and calls the solver method that, iteratively solves the partial differential equations. Um, then we have parameters uh, dot in. Actually, I forgot to change that. It's now called parameters dot PRM. Uh, this is a text file with input data. Uh, system, system dimensions. This is basically the, the, the file that it, the user will interact with. Um, it specifies the mesh, boundary conditions, time step, output format and frequency and user defined simulation parameters. Uh, but it actually, there's so many more options that you can input in here. Um, and I encourage you to look at the manual to see what all the, all the other all the possibilities are that you can set here. Um, the equations do need to be set in a, uh, this is again, so I just want to mention this file, actually you can change it and then you need to, you don't need to recompile the application. Uh, anything, any other changes that you do um, need to be recompiled. So the equations here are set in, um, the governing equations are uh, set in equations.cc, uh, where you need to declare, declare the expressions uh, on the weak form of the time dependent and time independent equations. ICCs and BCs are to set the initial conditions. And also if, if you have boundary conditions that are very simple, you can set them in parameters.in, but if you have uh, non-uniform, for instance, uh, boundary conditions, steer site boundary conditions, you can set them in, in this file in ICs and BCs. And then custom PDE.h contains the main class of the system, sorry, of the application, which is a child of the main class of the core library. Uh, and this is where you need to, uh, define all the parameters um, uh, that you define and you have, you need to declare all the parameters that you find in parameters.in. Uh, and then you also need to declare any application specific methods and methods that you may want to over override from the core library. So this, this is the, 
basically this is a file with all the methods or all the functions um, that are used in each application are defined. And it's gonna be separate for different applications. Um, and then optionally, you have a file for post-processing. So if, you're, if you want to look at something that, you know, we wanna do a calculation, for instance, the free energy, total free energy, or something that doesn't need, uh, the code doesn't need to find a solution, but you are interested in knowing, you can define it on postprocess.cc. Um, so for instance, yeah, as I mentioned, the free energy density, you can have you know, a sum of all the order parameters. Um, you can also uh, have the option to integrate that field. So if you wanna find the total energy, for instance, make sure that it's decreasing over time, you can do that in postprocess.cc. And then nucleation.cc, if it's present, um, it'll define the method to calculate the probability of nucleation. Uh, and it is only needed when nucleation is enabled. All right. Um, actually, why don't we take another break for questions? And maybe like, why don't we just also take like a five minute break for you guys to like, um, I think we're like pretty on time. What time is it? Yeah, it's 11. So, all right, let's take a, a, another break from questions. And then maybe if you would want to just like go get some coffee or um, stretch your legs or something. Um, why don't we do that? Uh, all read, right. Uh, yes. We, we answered some of the questions, so you have to read it through. And you don't have to answer all of them. Oh, I see. OK. Yeah, I but saw that you wrote them, a very um, extensive to the yep. chasm. OK. Uh, thank you for that. And we yeah. might want to deposit the, uh, you know, some of those papers to share directory. And somebody is asking for a PPT file as well. Okay. For, for your presentation. So maybe you can put all that together. Uh, yes, of course. Yes. Uh, well, I will, I will, yeah, I will send that. Um, yeah, if you can, if, if somebody is keeping, well, we're, we're going to keep track of the chat. Um, so somebody can, uh, if we could just keep track of what need, what's needed, um, I, I will go through all the chat and then see what, uh, what's needed and send, uh, send all of these materials after the, the session. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe, yeah, maybe the, maybe the presentation is probably a good idea to have it on. Well, it's going to be, there's going to be the recording, but you know, the PBT, we right. can have it on, uh, Google drive or something. I mean, is it, is it, is, if it is enough, you can just uh, um, send it through the chat and then they'll have it now. Um, I mean, sure. Yeah. I don't know how big it is. Though. I'm a little bit concerned about that. Let me see. Maybe you can make a, um, a PDF. Sure. So that there's no video. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to, uh, um, uh, I, I, I'll be right back. But, yeah, why uh, don't we reconvene break. at, so it's 11.03. Why don't we just reconvene at 11.10? And Thank everybody you. can take, everybody can take a break. <laughs> Thank you.
Oops, sorry. Can someone please confirm? Okay, I'm sorry, I didn't notice I was muted. <laughs> can someone confirm that you're seeing my slides? Uh, we do, we can yeah. see your slides. Great, thank you. All right, let's move on. So um, what I wanna show is uh, just how, you know, how would you go about, again, I'm gonna start with the can Hillier, sorry, the Allen can example, just because it's just simple. Um, how would you go about uh, from one example going from there to implementing the equations on Prism SPF, right? So uh, you have the, first you have the free energy. You know, you input this, let's assume for now that you have the parameters W and K to that free energy. And you also have some mobility M uh, for the dynamics. Uh, and suddenly you end up this, uh, this equation, this partial differential equation. Um, defined in terms of the uh, mobility and the order parameter. And of course, uh, it's not explicitly stated, but basically there's also, this is also depending on space. Uh, the order parameter is a function of space. So um, so the derivation of the, uh, so the first thing we need to do is actually, we actually need, since this is finite element, we need to derive a weak form of the equations of the Einkat model. So the way to do that is we start where there's, there's different places to start, you know, but uh, in Prism's PF, the documentation usually starts from uh, the time discretized uh, forward Euler method versions uh, equation. So we have the governing equation, which is a continuous equation. Um, so the first step of the, for this is discretizing time. Um, I apologize. Um, this should be on the right. The bottom equation should be phi n plus y equals phi n. Um, so then the idea is the, um, the field at time n plus one, so n is the time step, equals the field at time n minus this whole term, uh, which is the mobility times the variational derivative. So that's on the third line. And then from there, uh, what we can do is we can integrate uh, over the whole system, the whole system volume. And uh, the way to do that, but then we also, uh, we are going to uh, integrate with a test function and this test fun function is any arbitrary test function. That's that's to, to get the weak form. This should be the hold for any arbitrary test function. Uh, and then the only condition is that that test function is zero at the boundaries of the domain. Um, so if we arrange some terms, um, and then I don't really have it explicitly here. Uh, but if we use the divergence theorem to integrate the second part, uh, the gradient part of this equation or the Laplacian part, we get that second term um, uh, below, uh, which is the, which as you can see has the gradient of this test function multiplied by the gradient of the order parameter. So we have two terms, one proportional to the test function itself, and then one proportional to the gradient of that test function. Um, and the way to calculate uh, the, the input terms is that we're gonna actually, we're gonna actually input these two terms um, into the equations. And the left term is called the value term because it's just, well, it's, I don't know, you, you, you could call it the scalar term, uh, but in the, in the, um, uh, um, in the documentation it's called the value term. And then on the, uh, the, the, on the, the right-hand side, the, sorry, the second term on the right-hand side is called the gradient term. And this is what you have to directly input into person's PF, these two terms. Um, <clears throat> and I'll, I'm going to show you where, where exactly these terms are uh, specified. All right, so this is with this, we be, let's begin our interactive, se interactive session.
So I want everyone to um, kind of do the same thing that I will do. Um, again, if you get a little behind, don't worry too much. Just remember that you, you can ask a question, but uh, just remember that this is recorded and then you can just follow um, on your own uh, by watching the video. Okay, so let's, uh, let's just close this. I'm gonna close my, um, I'm gonna close my, uh, um, and I'm gonna, uh, well, I'm still sharing the screen, hopefully. Do you, does everyone, sorry, I need to just make, just to confirm, does everyone see uh, that I have a finder? Yes, we can see you. Okay. Thank you. So yes, I have a finder and then um, I use Mac OS, uh, but then if you have Linux, uh, whatever you wanna use, um, let's go and, and check this out. Actually, it would be good if we can have this kind of, I'm just gonna have this, this line here. Well, you know what? Sorry, I'm gonna just create a screenshot of this. Okay, and then I'm going to just have it kind of open so that we can see the equations that we need to input, right? Okay, so I want, I want to just uh, br briefly look at the structure uh, of Prisons PF. So we have the main directory, which you clone right from the repository. Uh, again, if you have installed this, you should already have this, um, we have, I have done this. And then this directory contains the core library, which if you do use a Docker installation, this is already pre-compiled. So you don't have to really worry about this. Uh, if you do a different installation method, you will have to, pre uh, we have to compile the core library once. Um, and then once, once we've, uh, we have that, we'll just go to um, all the applications. And these are all the applications uh, in Prisons PF. Actually, there's more hidden in there. Um, and uh, obviously these three actually, I, the PS uh, are the problem set applications that I just created, but all the others uh, are the, the built-in applications. So I encourage you to just explore all these applications and what they do. Each application will have a document, documentation file where you can uh, see what each application does and what are the equations and everything. So let's go to Alan Can. Um, <clears throat> sorry. So let's look at the files. Uh, we already talked about the files that uh, that we have for each application. Uh, but let's let's go through like all the files like one by one. So first of all, we have um, the formulation. This is the documentation of the application. It's very. It's just a minimal derivation. It's the derivation steps, but you know you should be able. There's, they're not in a whole lot of detail. So if you want to really follow uh, something, you'll you'll have to uh, know a little bit about it, multivariate calculus um, in order to 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 get all the steps on your own. And you're actually encouraged to do this. Um, then we have CMake lists, which is just a file that uh, will help us. Uh, with CMake, uh, so to compile and run the application, um, I will, I will, I will show you how to compile an application. Uh, but it's very, very simple. Um, then we have ICs, and let's actually just open a bunch of files at the same time, and then just look at them. I'm skipping some files. I'm going to tell you later what they are. Uh, but basically, these are the main files of the applications. Um, and okay, here we are in Xcode. Okay, hopefully you can see them. Um, let's start with uh, parameters. Again, this is the main file that most users will interact with. So we have number of dimensions, as I mentioned, uh, we have the domain size. Uh, if we have a two-dimensional system, the third dimension is just ignored, so you can just put it or not put it. Um, the subdivisions are the number of divisions that you want to um, uh, divide your system in. So usually the way that this works is you have an adaptive mesh, and then 
you have a refine factor. So this refine factor of eight means that you're going to have eight subdivisions in each direction. So you're going to divide the system by two, and then by two again, and then by two, and then by two, et cetera, et cetera, eight times. So the number of uh, elements uh, that you will have on each direction is two to the power of eight, right? But then subdivisions are like pre-divisions on top of that. So I could have like three by three by three, for instance, three and three in the, in the X and Y direction, uh, right? And then that will actually create a system that is that, and then each of these, you know, three squares, each of these nine squares uh, will be subdivided uh, with a refined factor of eight. So that gives us, gives us some flexibility um, on what we can do. Uh, this is the element degree. Again, it's set to one, but in general, it would be more efficient. Usually, it's most efficient to, to, be, to set it to two. Um, then we have the time step, uh, the number of time, step, time steps. Again, there's a whole other bunch of options that you can set here. This is a very one of the simplest uh, applications. Uh, so obviously, the total simulation time will be the time step times the number of time steps, right? So in this case, it'll be 50, right? Um, then we have some options to how to say, how do we add to output parameters? So in this case, for instance, we have five outputs and we want them equally spaced, right? So that means if we have 50, 50 we have a, a time of 50, it'll output at uh, you know, 10, 20, 30, or in terms of time steps, it will output at 1,000, 2,000, 3,000, you know, 4,000, 5,000. 5, so you'll have an output every thousand time steps. Uh, <clears throat> you, this, this option is to set uh, whether you want to have kind of a summary of every time it outputs, how long it took, how long of, uh, everything took. So keep, keep track of uh, the time of every process um, between outputs. Uh, and then we can see, you know, what, what is taking, uh, you know, if you have, for, for instance, you have something slow, you know, what's, what's taking the bulk of the time? Is it, is it because it's taking too long in the adaption? So it's a good way to, to look at uh, what your code is doing. <clears throat> and then you have a set script print steps. So this is just how many steps will it skip in order uh, for the code to print to the screen, right? So that just means don't print anything, uh, uh, just print something on, um, every thousand steps. Uh, <clears throat> then we have, uh, we can set the boundary conditions and then we can, you know, you have a, a square or a box, for instance, we have, you know, these sets the boundary conditions of every edge. Um, I should say more generally, we can have a rectangle or a, a you know, prism, um, a square prism in 3D, uh, but, um, so this, this condition sets, uh, for instance, and if we have natural, that natural means zero derivative. So that means that order parameter n will have a zero derivative at the edge. And the fact that we just define one of them, that means that all boundary conditions will be zero derivative, right? So if we have a 2D system, top down, left, right will be zero derivative. Um, <clears throat> the model constants, um, are the constants that we will need for uh, uh, the model. So in this case, we've actually defined mobility as a constant and uh, the um, gradient energy of uh, um, this, basically this K value, the, the gradient energy coefficient. Um, and again, these, these values are just not set arbitrarily. They, they are set in such way that we, we will get a desired uh, interfacial energy and a desired uh, interfacial width. Um, <clears throat> um, the, the, the actual uh, W, which is kind of um, the coefficient for the uh, double well part is just been set to one. One of the things I should mention is you don't really need to set these coefficients. You can actually just put them in the equations, but then if you wanna change them, it's convenient to set them here because then you can just change them and you don't have to recompile everything again. So this, this text is, this, this, uh, um, this, this file is parsed um, at the time of runtime. 
Um, and then all of this data is captured by the code and then it's set, you know, saved as different variables. And then you can have access to these variables. Um, the, the code has access to each of these variables uh, throughout the simulation. Um, again, I don't wanna, uh, for instance, let's talk, let's see main. Uh, so here main, oh, sorry. I, I don't hope this is not on the way of stuff. I'm gonna move this um, out of the way. Yeah, so for instance, main is, uh, it just essentially includes kind of the very general structure of the code. And uh, you can see basically what main does is it does all this, reads the user inputs, builds the fields, builds the field, sorry, initialize the uh, problem and then solve this is what does the, the whole time loop, right? And then it ends. So it's not, re not, not really something that you want to change uh, probably uh, unless you're doing some kind of advanced development. Uh, custom PDE, as I mentioned, is you know has set all the classes um, that you will need in this. So they're already predefined. So these are all the classes. Sorry, this is a class, and this, this contains all the variables and the methods that are local to this application. So all the all the methods or functions that are defined in other files are actually declared here. And then and then they. Are, you know, they're all members of custom PDE. <clears throat> um, so again, average user will have to just uh, uh, in, interject into the uh, methods definition. Uh, but what you will want to do is declare the, the model constants. You will have to declare these. So uh, if we define them in, in, in parameters.prm, we'll have to define them on um, custom PDE. Okay, um, and then what it, this does is just says, it just says uh, name a variable and set it equal to what's labeled MNV um, in, the, um, uh, um, in the parameters file. Uh, let's go to initial conditions. Um, so again, this, if you want to set the initial conditions, um, uh, you, you, well, basically you always need to set an initial, some set of initial conditions. So you, you're always gonna have to do something in this file. So what this does, um, so the Allen can has kind of just a bunch of blobs uh, superimposed with each other. And then it just calculates some evolution from that. And so first you have to need, you define the center of where these blobs are, uh, kind of the radius, of this, uh, then you have to uh, define kind of a distance function. You have to declare a distance function, which will be a distance function from all these centers. And depending on that distance function, you will want to um, you will want to define a um, whether your order parameter is zero or one. But you want to do this smoothly so you can use a uh, hyperbolic tangent function, right? Uh, you know, the simplest possible case would be you want to have just a circular domain and then you would just set, you know, you would set up a, a, tan, a hyperbolic tangent so that be below a certain radius away from the center of that domain, um, you will have an order parameter equals to one. And then um, away from it, you'll have an order parameter equals to zero. And so the scalar, scalar AC, IC is, uh, so basically, one thing that I should mention, and then it's it's important to understand this, is that this this method is called for every basically the main code does a loop over all order parameters and all points in the mesh, um, and then this <clears throat> this boundary condition uh, this method uh, will say okay what's the point and what's the order parameter then the order parameter or the uh, it will be defined by the index. Um, unfortunately, actually, we don't have an index here because we only have one order parameter, but the index value will correspond to order parameter. So basically we have to have a bunch of conditionals to say if the index is one, it'll set the boundary conditions for order parameter one. If the index is zero, set it for order parameter zero and so on and so on. 
uh, yeah, unfortunately, this is the Allen kind of application. It will be clearer once you see it uh, on the can healer because you have you'll have two. Or if you use a can healer, if you look at the can healer and can also also be, uh, I think I believe you'll you'll see three of these um, order parameters. And then scalar AC IC is kind of the result of that. Uh, it basically says it's it's the return of the function. So if you set scalar AC it'll just return the value of what you set. You want to set the order parameter for that index. Uh, we don't have anything here right now, but um, <clears throat> this is where you would set uh, non-uniform Dirichlet boundary conditions. So you would have to define an edge um, and then you will say, you know, once I define an edge and once I define an order parameter, again, given by index, return this value around this edge um, and then this value can depend on the position along the edge, or you can even depend on the time. Um, so this is also a way to, to uh, input time uh, dependent boundary conditions, but there is today. Um, okay, so now let's go to equations. Sorry, I'm getting notices that Reza is Razor. Do you have like a lot of questions, Reza, or uh, is, is there something? I'm just trying to, can I unraise your, unra your hand? Anyway, just if you, if you wanna just ask a question, just put it in the chat and then that's just easier. Um, and and the, the question in the chat, um, you know, we are constantly answering it. Yes, uh, yes, exactly. So Bonnie, um, Kubra and I. Yes, thank you. Mm -hmm. So, um, okay, so equations. Uh, so this is where we'll declare all the order parameters, all the fields, right? Uh, actually, I keep referring these to order parameters. Some of the fields will not be order parameters. For instance, um, um, in, the, in the can here, Allen can, sometimes the concentration is not really order parameter, it's just really the co local composition. Um, or you can have other fields that are in order parameters, but basically all the fields that will be involved uh, in the calculation and which will obey to some uh, that are governed by some um, dynamics. Um, and you have to define, you know, the, the um, some of these fields can be auxiliary terms uh, for other equations. But for Allen can we have just something very simple. So we just have, uh, a field that we'll call n, and that'll be the order parameter. Uh, every field needs to have an index, and it'll all and it needs to start with a zero. And then it has a type, which in case is the scalar. Then it has a uh, variable equation type, which means again, every each one of these fields needs to be associated with a an equation, and this is the equation type. So this will be explicit, time dependent, right? There's other types of questions. It could be auxiliary, it could be um, uh, non, non uh, time independent, uh, or now, you know, coming soon, we can we will be able to have uh, implicit time dependent as well. Uh, and then these two are uh, two um, important things. And this basically sets for that equation, what will the right hand side terms? Uh, need. So for instance, we will require, so this is a good uh, moment. Um, this is a good moment to look into, um, to look into this uh, um, snapshot of the slide that I took. So the right hand side value term is the first term and it's multiplying the test function the, in, the integrand, and then this will require uh, the value of n, because with n, n sorry, I should mention that n in this in the slides is phi. Uh, sorry, phi. Um, but if we have n, we can calculate this partial derivative, and we obviously can calculate you know phi itself. So. Basically, what this line, these two lines say is what we will need to declare uh, for the code to calculate each of these terms. And then for the gradient term, 
uh, we will need to calculate the gradient uh, of phi. We will only need the gradient of phi and a bunch of constants. So that's all we need. And then uh, for this type of equations, all we need to set is the right-hand side of the explicit equation. The left-hand side is always the same. It's just the, the, the value of that field at the next step. So all we need to set is a right-hand side in this case. <clears throat> so the way we do this is first we set, you know, we, we kind of say, ask the code, give me the current values of M, uh, which we'll need to calculate, you know, the free energy, the derivative of the free energy. Uh, and also give me the, you know, this NX is shorthand for gradient. Uh, it doesn't mean it's gradient in the X direction. It just means it's, um, it's the, it's the, it's actually has an X and Y components and it is a vector. As you can see, it's a different type. It's scalar grad type. So it has an X and a Y component. And if it's three dimensions, it's X, Y, Z. Um, <clears throat> so here is um, the, this term here, it represents the uh, derivative um, of this. Um, uh, basically it's this term here. And it is the derivative with respect to the order parameter, um, which I showed in some other slides. Um, let me see if I can just copy it. Yeah, let me just real copy it real quick. So, yeah, it's this term. Uh, but it's only the, the term that's on square brackets, right? And then also I uh, it's slightly re slightly rewritten um, so that the, the main coefficient is four, but it's it's identical. Uh, then we then with that we can just define uh, the term that is going to be the, the value term, as you can see, uh, here we have n, which is phi n. Again, the no I'm sorry, the notation is not great, but you know, for prisons PF, n tends to be the order parameter. Um, and then we, uh, we're subtracting these constant values, which we need to use this uh, const b operator. Uh, in order to be able to uh, do the operation between um, a constant and a scalar value type or a scalar, scalar vector type. And then F and B, as you can see, is already the derivative of the bulk part of the free energy with respect to the order parameter. And then the gradient term below is this ec equation Xn. And then as you can see, it's just this minus delta V, delta T times K times mobility times NX, which is the gradient, as you might recall, it's the gradient of the order parameter. And then once we have that, we just set them. And so what this does, these two lines do, so what, what these two lines do is that it passes this information to the solver. And that's all the user really is concerned about. It doesn't care about how the solver is going to do things. All he needs to know, all the solver needs to know is these two terms. And uh, you know, it'll take care of, um, of, of solving this with a finite element method. You know, so basically you'll, it'll, create, it'll deal with all the matrix equations, um, but it's in the background. Um, so this is again, very simple example. The idea of the um, <clears throat> the idea of the of the problem set is that you can actually look at a lot of slightly more complicated examples, uh, and then you'll be able to to um, hopefully that that'll uh, give you uh, more of a, a feel of the the use of prisons PF. Yeah. Um, okay, so let's uh, let's actually run this. Um, so we have. Uh, let's go to the 
am I already in the Allen count application? Let's go to the Allen. So I'm, I'm going to go to, um, let me see if I can make this a little bigger. Oh, yeah. All right, I'm going to just make the font in my terminal a little bigger so I don't have to squint. Um, I'm going to, so I'm, I'm going to type PWE. That's going to tell me where I am. And so I'm inside, what's important is going to be I'm inside phase field, the phase field folder, and then I'm inside the applications, right? And uh, this is an alias that I have. So it gives me the applications in order and the, the ones that have been modified last at the end. Uh, so I'm going to go to Alan Can. OK. And if I haven't compiled an application, uh, if I haven't run, if I just if I'm just there, first thing I need to do is compile it, and then the way to do this is cmake dot, okay, and it'll read this uh, instructions on um, cmake lists, uh, and it'll create the make file, and the make file will actually compile the code. Uh, Okay, it should take just a few seconds. Um, hopefully. Uh, you can, I don't know if you uh, are able to follow this, but you may be, yeah, you may, you may take a little longer or, or uh, maybe faster. It's done. So let's clear this. And I'm sorry, this keeps getting on the way. <clears throat> and now I'm going to do uh, make. Um, uh, I'm going to actually compile, but it's faster actually if you have many processors you can actually compile in parallel so i'm going to do and i'm going to set the number of processors i have four processors in my computer so i'm just going to put dash j4 to compile four processors and i'm going to do the release version i do the release version because i know this works if you want to uh, debug your code it's better to actually if you have a, just a code that you just wrote or you just modified some equations it's probably better to use the debug mode uh, since I know that Allen can works, I'll just compile the release version. And there it is. I'm going to get some warnings because there's an incompatibility uh, between the version of my um, DL2 version installed locally and persons PF. But these in general, they're not a problem. And uh, we will actually soon update the, the, the prisons PF versions to, to eliminate these warnings. Uh, so this is just mostly due to deprecated, uh, deprecated methods in TL2, but that still work. Um, so yeah, as long as you get warnings, but no errors, it's all good. Again, it should take a few seconds. And then some warnings are just due to unused parameters, actually, um, which is fine. It just means that you're not using them, but it doesn't necessarily mean you need to use them. Um, uh, OK, so I have some warnings, but it's built. And it's, it's uh, so basically, once it says build target main, it means it's compiled successfully. Let's clear the screen again. Um, and then it's just we can just run the code. Um, the simplest way to run it is just type dot dash main, um, or you can use MPI to run it, MPI run, and then dash n. Remember that for MPI, you have to set the number of processors as n. When you compile, the number of processors is j. So again, I have four processors. I'm just going to run on four processors, and that's, I'll make just faster, right? And then you just type main. OK, uh, one option you can actually do, I'm not going to do it right now, but I want an option is you, if you want to modify the name of the input file to something different that's parameters, you can type, you can have this option. And then you can type here, my input file dot PRM. 
the extension needs to be PRM. But uh, the input file can be whatever. So maybe, maybe you want to have different input files uh, where you change different conditions. And then that way you can just select which one you want to read from. Um, but right now I'm just going to do main and it's going to read from parameters PRM. And this should take about you know, 12 or so seconds to finish. Let's see, maybe a little more. That's gonna take like 15 seconds. Um, all right, 19 seconds, 20 seconds. This depends on, um, sometimes it's faster, but anyway, it's not really that big of a deal. So it's, it's, it's done 5,000 time steps in 20 seconds right and this is as uh, i remember if you remember i i, I mentioned that uh, there's an option to set and this is this will always print this at the end and this is kind of the um the report of what took how much time um so for instance here it said uh, the right computing the right hand side took 68 percent of the time um, initialization took 1.7% uh, of the time. Outputting took 18% of the time. So if you want to save some time, perhaps you wanted to have less outputs, et cetera, et cetera. So solving the solving uh, took, so outputting is part of solving. So this, this solve doesn't mean this doesn't mean the solution. It just means the solver, the solve uh, method, which includes outputting. And then solve increments is actually the, just solution of one time step. So this is this would be more really what this 79 would be more really what's uh, the code is spending um, in the solution. Uh, <clears throat> uh, okay, so uh, let's actually go and open um, again. Um, you can use PowerView or Visit. I like Visit, uh, but any visualization software that can read VTU files should work uh, or VTK files. Oh, actually, let's first let's uh, let's see what happened. So, uh, as you can see, the code has uh, created a bunch of files, right? Um, and these solution files are the contain all the information, uh, all the output information of the order parameters, and then you can read these files with uh, something like visit or pair view, and then plot all the plot all the variables that you need or uh, all the post-processing variables, um, et cetera. And then this integrated files, actually look, let's look at it, what it is. Um, uh, this is something that's generated by post-processing and um, actually this, this first, I didn't show you the post-processing file, but this um, actually sums the magnitude of the gradient of the order parameter everywhere. So it integrates the magnitude of the gradient of the order parameter. And then this, um, <clears throat> this is the total free energy. So as you can see, this needs to be decreasing. If they're not, there's something wrong, right? This is some. This is a sanity check uh, that your code is working as if the free energy is decreasing. Um, all right, so let's just open visit. Uh, I'm gonna open it from the command line, but you can open it from everywhere you want. Uh, the advantage of opening from the command line is that it'll already be in the directory um, where I'm interested in opening the file. So if I open the file, it already has the path that I've been working on. So it's, it's this path, right? So I will select a family of files. It already knows how to group them and I just open them all simultaneously. So I'm gonna click on okay and I will just add a pseudocolor plot, which is a 2D plot where color represents a value. You know, I will show you what, uh, 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 it'll be clear when, once we plot it. And then I have all these options of what do I want to plot. So um, I'm going to plot the order parameter and then I'm gonna draw. And then on the right-hand side, you'll see uh, this is the initial condition. Obviously, it doesn't look like anything that makes sense, but it's just some initial condition to give us the evolution, to show the evolution of the can of the Allen can equation, right? And so as you can see here, I can see each frame, right? As it evolves in time. 
And this window here is showing me uh, both the cycle, which is the time step, and the time, which is the actual you know, simulation time. Um, remember that we had a time step of 10 to minus 2, which is 0 0.01, which means 100 times smaller than um, the actual number of time steps. And uh, you know, th this is uh, uh, something that is expected usually, uh, unless you, you know, maybe some of you will have experience with this, but uh, basically what Alan Kant tries to do is minimize curvature, right? So uh, all, all of these, you know, all of these sharp curvature regions will try to disappear real quick. Um, and uh, eventually everything will be just kind of a, um, a uniform system actually. Uh, unless you have you start with uh, exact proportion of uh, one face and another face. So these is you know obviously here, red is one face, blue is another face, and green is uh, green yellow ish is an interface. Um, so unless we start you start with an initial proportion of uh, 50 50 for each, basically one face is going to win. Remember this does not be need to be conserved. Um, if you actually run can Hilliard, you will see that the proportion of each phase will stay the same through time. Not so in Alan Kant. Um, I think I have like, uh, let me see what time is it? I think I have like five minutes. So um, in those five minutes, I'm just gonna actually, um, you should have at this point received um, an email containing the problem set that we will uh, look into, um, that you will, the idea is to, for you to solve this problem set on your own time, and then we can, you know, meet on Wednesday and ask questions, but I'm going to just solve the first, the first, uh, um, the first problem of that problem set. Um, let me see if I can find it here. Um, materials, problem set. Uh, Okay, right. So uh, what this is saying is um, the first problem is just says, change the boundary conditions for the Allen can example problem, right? Um, and then it says, just change the, Allen, the boundary conditions in the Allen can application um, <clears throat> to zero, zero derivative, zero flux, um, which means natural on the top boundary. Uh, then on the bottom boundary, set it to Dirichlet, which means fixed to a value. And then on the left and right, set it to periodic, right? Um, so let's just go ahead and do that. Um, and um, so the way I'm gonna do that is uh, I'm gonna I'm going to make a copy of the parameters file. So just so the not to touch the existing parameters file, I'm just going to make a copy. And then I'm just going to copy it into uh, um, a file called parameters. And then maybe like, I'll, I'll just call it P1 because it's a problem set one. Okay. And then I'm going to edit this file. <clears throat> Okay, and um, let's bring back let's bring back the problem set. Sorry, I don't need to see this. Some length. How do I hide the sidebar? Nope. Anyway, never mind. Okay. So left and right periodic, bottom Dirichlet zero, uh, top Dirichlet um, um, sorry uh, Neumann uh, zero zero derivative, uh, which is natural. So uh, I'm going to go to this file. I'm going to go where the boundary conditions are. And if you actually read this, it shows the order in which 
these boundary conditions will be defined. So the order is in 2D. It means left, right, bottom, top. Sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. Left, right, bottom, and top. All right. So let's uh, cancel. Let's comment out this line. And let's say, so we started left, right? So, and then we said periodic on the left. Um, then uh, also on the right, opposite faces need to be periodic. Well, otherwise the, the system doesn't make any sense. Um, need to be both periodic, I should specify. And then the bottom, it was Dirichlet one, sorry, Dirichlet equal to zero, right? And the top was Neumann, which means natural. Um, and that's it. And then we, so we save. And I'm gonna run the code, uh, but I'm gonna tell it that I want to read this parameters file, right? And Uh, now it should produce a different result. Actually, let's take a screenshot of this last image because what, we're, what I'm gonna do is now there's new files in this same directory. So as they're being replaced, so I'm gonna just refresh the data that this has but I want to be able to compare it with the original simulation that we had, right? So, um, so how does the boundary conditions affect this? So <clears throat> if you remember, uh, we set the top to be natural. Uh, so that means that we are expecting the top, actually, the one feature of the natural boundary conditions is all interfaces are, are perpendicular to that boundary, as you can see here. And so as you can see in this problem, all interfaces are perpendicular to each of the boundaries because they're all in natural boundary conditions. Uh, but we want top to be natural, bottom to be Dirichlet, so it should be uniform. And then left and right, they're going to be periodic. So that means like if we go on the left side and then we reach the end of the system, it sort of should continue, should wrap around the, the right hand side, right? So let's try that. And then let's just, uh, let's just reopen. Uh, and then there you go. As you can see, everything here, bottom, bottom is all blue. Actually, let's, let's see the evolution. So the evolution is uh, right away, you, you see no red at the boundaries because we set the or parameter to be blue or right there, right? Uh, again, the whole evolution is su such that it wants to reduce the overall curvature of these interfaces, make them flat or as flat as they can. Um, and then, yeah, so left and right, you can sort of see how this part uh, keeps going on this and then the bottom keeps going, so it continues. It's a smooth continuation. And then the top is just natural, which means the, the interfaces are parallel to that boundary. So it makes sense, right? All right, so I'm gonna stop here. Um, I think it's noon already in here, at least in um, Ann Arbor. Um, and uh, I will, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take some, I'm gonna take maybe half an hour or I'm gonna as much as time as, I, as, as uh, it's needed to answer uh, most of your questions. Hopefully I will, um, I'll be able to answer questions about this. Uh, but if you want to just go do the exercises on your own, um, just uh, uh, we'll see each other on Wednesday and Wednesday will just be questions about the problem set. Has, I, uh, has everybody received the problem set? Has someone not received the problem set via email? Just want to make sure everybody has a problem set. All right, seems like everybody does. So with this, I will th I thank you very much for showing up today. Um, and I will do my best to answer any remaining questions. 
Okay. For those of you who, who, who don't want to say, um, uh, yeah, thank you for being here. And then you can just sign off. The session is kind of officially over except for questions. Uh, all right. Actually, I don't know if, uh, yeah, anyway, I don't want to ask anyone else to say, so I'll just try to do my own. <laughs> um, all right, let me stop sharing. The recording will be made available to everybody, right? Excuse me? If the recording will be made available to everybody, right? Yes. How, where do they get it? Where can they find it? No, I don't know yet. I don't, I don't know. I have to look into this. Uh, it's, in, it's, it's recording to the cloud. But as soon as, as soon as it stops, I will look into sharing it with everyone. Uh, you see, I see you there. I'm sitting here. Oh, okay, okay. So I'm yeah. Sorry, David. Uh, we can have access to the recorded film. Yeah. You will be able to. Yeah. I, I'm just gonna make sure that I'm. I'm gonna make sure that you have as soon as as soon as the recording is over. Okay. I will. I because I've never recorded a session, so it's in the cloud. So as soon as it's over, I'm gonna look into where, where it is located, mm -hmm. and I'm gonna share that link with you. With okay. everyone. So, so you you will receive a um a link. Okay. Uh, David, uh, mm -hmm. from from um, Zoom, oh, okay. and uh, you can send the link to to everybody. Um, I guess by email. Is that how, how you're going to do it? Yeah, yeah. That's why I have a mailing list, so I'll just you okay. know of all yeah. participants. Mm -hmm. So I will just share it to everyone. Sounds good. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thanks yeah. very much. Thanks. Thank you, me. and thank you, thank you, Katsuya, for answering questions. Oh no problem. It's really helpful. Um, yeah, I'm collecting the ones that have me oh. answered. Uh, I sent you one. Okay, okay. Uh, so if you can check, you can go from the bottom. I, I'm reading through it and then I'll send you ones that are not. Okay, answered. okay, thanks. Um, I'm trying to, so you just started uh, after the session was over, continue. I, I just sent, yeah, I just sent, sent you okay, uh, okay. one. You started with questions that are not answered to the best of my knowledge. Okay. So somebody asked, can homo non-homogeneous natural boundary conditions also be implemented in the fr framework? Not at the moment, but there seems to be a very, um, uh, like a strong interest in this, for this to happen. Um, so, um, yeah, so uh, somebody actually contacted me. Um, I don't know if this is the same person. Um, and uh, we, will, we will try to get this done um, as soon as, I know that Steve um, had some work done on, the, on this, but uh, I don't know how far we, he, he went, but if this, will, this will, will make this a priority because there seems to be uh, an interest on this. Okay. That might be it. Um, um, oh, really? I'm looking through. Where can I find the prisms files? I can run everything oh, in okay. Docker, but I can't find the prisms files. Uh, the, pris the, the parameters PRM to edit the boundary conditions. Oh, this may be a problem with Docker, um, Kayla. Um, so if you run Docker successfully, you have to mount it to a local, to your local face field directory. So I don't know if your question is regarding like everything works, you're inside the Docker, the container, the Docker container, but then once you exit the container, you can't file the output files. Um, I don't understand. So, but it, it seems like you don't find the parameters.prm that, that is. Yeah, I guess yeah. I don't. I can call them in Ubuntu, mm -hmm. and I can I can do all of the calculations in Ubuntu, but I can't actually pull up the physical files. Oh, uh, those uh, there's a place where those files are. Um, I don't know if I just if I actually did write this on on. Yeah, I guess not. You're you're in Windows, right? Yes. Um, I think that you can actually, so from Ubuntu, you can copy that to your like local C drive. And I believe that what you have to do is, uh, you know, for instance, you, you copy, you copy, you know, 
say the output files, for instance, solution. Well, there, there's two ways. You can actually access this part through your Windows, from your Windows, uh, you know, fi finder. Okay. You just have to look, just, I, I don't remember right now where it is. You can just Google, uh, you know, where are Ubuntu files located? But okay. another way is you can, from Ubuntu, you can actually move them to a directory. So for instance, if you have, if you are in the directory that you want, you can copy, uh, copy, you know, solution, the solution family of files, uh, dot, you know, uh, um, solution star, which is copy all the solution files. And then I think it's like uh, MNT C, and then I think maybe home, uh, my name or whatever directory you have. And then, uh, you know, you can do like prisms. Um, try something like this, and then you can actually output all the files that you care about into, you know, your normal C directory or, or your documents. Um, I just, oh, I'm sorry. I wrote that in the chat, but it was it came out as a private message. Okay, so it's there. Uh, but anyway, you should you should be able to Google it and just find it. There's uh, there somewhere. <laughs> okay, so I got to yeah, just Docker. Sorry, what? Do they need to be copied to Docker then in order to find the files themselves? Mm, no, okay, no, no, no. So once you exit the Docker container, you mm -hmm. should be able to still see the files in Ubuntu if you gotcha. launch the container correctly. So now uh, this is not really to do with Docker. It's more to do with like Ubuntu, like your Ubuntu local uh, virtual environment will have a directory where your files are located. Oh, okay. Yeah, so you have the Ubuntu app, just, just Google where are files Locate it in the you know in the Ubuntu app. Gotcha. Okay, yep. so that's the part I'm missing. Thank you. Yeah. All right. You're welcome. Uh, all right. There, there's a question about uh, from um, uh, Sozan um, oh, okay. regarding using P uh, Prism PF on supercomputers. Any benchmark marking to see if it's CPU bound or memory bound? Et cetera. Do you see that? Do you see it? Yeah. Yeah. How does now deal with an adaptive mesh? Um, CPU bound or memory bound? Sorry, I'm not. It depends following. on the program. So you know, yeah. and then you know, uh, adaptive mesh. You know, you know. I think it depends. Oh, I see. Like if it's limited, limited by CPU. Or, yeah, or yeah, number. yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So it depends on the problem. Yeah, sorry, you're, I'm just repeating what you said. Um, yeah. If you have a problem that um, has a lot of degrees of freedom, um, yeah, eventually you may run out of memory. But like, I'm, 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 yeah, you know, how much resolution you yeah. need, some problems require higher resolution. Yeah. Um, depends on uh, how thin the interface has to be with respect to the, you know, com com uh, domain size and things like that. Yeah. Yeah, it's kind of hard to tell. Yeah, it's it depends. Um, and then it says, how does how does now deal with having an adaptive mesh? More or less grid points could make it slower or faster. Yes, so that's you know you kind of have to um, try to. It's a little bit of trial and error. You can say you know I'm going to adapt, you know finer, um, you know within some bounds of refinement, and you know that will make it slower or faster, I guess, I, I, I'm guessing you're also thinking of like, does the adapt adaption process itself may make it slower? So yes, there's a way to set the number of time steps between adaptions so that, you know, they are separated enough that it won't consume CPU time, but that know so far apart that the interface won't advance to a parts of uh, uh, unadapted regions. Then it says some optimistic softwares, maybe even for CFD, have dynamic load balance to deal with this. Is that something that would be yeah, interesting? 
Well, I think it's doing it, right? Yeah, uh, I think Dir so. Yeah. DIR2 is, uh, is automatically doing this. Yeah. Um, so, you know, also adaptive mesh um, effectiveness depends on the problem too. If there's a lot of interface, yeah. then, then it, you know, you know, it doesn't help as much because you, you need to resolve the interface. Exactly. Exactly. Almost everywhere, right? Mm -hmm. So, yeah. and then there's a question. Yeah, that, that I don't know if, if uh, Sozan's through there, but uh, does that answer um, can your question? Can you hear me? Oh yes, it's kind of did, but it's, the thing is, I have a problem with because a face field. I mean, can be quite slow. So we have a model that we have on the supercomputer, and then it depends a lot on how many cores we use. Right. Um, and if we, so if I keep changing the mesh, then I'm, and it still keep the same amount of CPUs, um, mm -hmm. then it can get, I mean, it, it, it's not effective. Um, so I'm trying to have as many CPUs as I have nodes, for example. Mm -hmm. um, but it seems like my problem is memory bound, it doesn't scale with the amount of processors. Okay. Are you using Prism PF? No, I'm actually using Moose. Okay, moment, okay. Because I need to use Fluxes for my system. Okay. Um, you but mean yeah. Fluxes as Moose in the... Is, Moose is well, different, you know, uh, so, 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 so Prism's PF is using, um, it, uh, what is it, uh, um, matrix-free, right? Mm -hmm. So, so it's a, it's a different computational, mm -hmm framework, numerical, you know, mm -hmm. uh, framework. Yeah. So, so the behavior is quite different. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but, you know, whether it's memory bound or not, for example, you, you know, one example would be, um, I'm sorry, I don't know why. Okay. Um, the, um, one example would be like, you know, if you are doing um, uh, grain growth and there are lots of grains, mm -hmm. um, you know, you might use that on memory, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. Um, so it, it depends on the co you know yeah. complexity I, of the calculation that needs to be mm -hmm. done mm -hmm. in the simulation too. Yep. So can I ask what scenario are you simulating? Um, so um, I work with battery materials. Um, okay. So at the moment, I'm simulating ele electro materials where I want to have basically a flux of ions moving in or out of the system. Oh, I see. Um, yeah. So, and and then I'm trying to connect the, I mean, which has already been done with a lot of homemade codes, but you mm -hmm. use the butler volmer equation to, mm -hmm. to uh, connect the flux of ions to the chemical potential in the system. And then the chemical potential I is, see. of course, uh, from the free energy function. Okay. Okay. And the functional. Yeah. So, so you the, application, the clo closest one is the corrosion. Mm -hmm. Yes, exactly. And I've yeah, looked I'll... at it, but then you have the smooth boundary method, which is also really interesting. But yes. then in the end, I also, because I want to have a um, mass balance in the system, so I want to have the same amount, I mean, more of ions coming into the system. So if, yeah. this, if these ions go into the electrode, I'd want, I'm, I'm going to deplete ions from the electrolytes. And the idea is to keep um, ions coming in all the time. So you so, can actually do that with the smooth boundary method. Actually, that's yeah. one of the things that I didn't mention, but yeah, I should right. have. Is yeah, that but then in the but in the smooth boundary method, you will have um, flux coming into like the, the solid material in the during corrosion, for example. Yeah, you, you can set but it up not into way. the box like the system you will can. still you be can closed, too. right? Yeah, you can because you can put okay. a frame. You can put a frame in the in the in the edge of the box. Okay. Yeah, you put the extra layer and yes. then uh, you put the uh, smooth boundary inside and then set the bound okay. uh, boundary condition there. So, yeah. Okay, so it, it would be like two boxes, and the system that I'm looking at is, is the, the middle box, so but outside is kind of the outside world where I keep getting. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Okay. That's... Yeah. So that's that's one workaround. I mean, it's not it's yeah. not ideal, but I mean, yeah. it's 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 doable. Yeah. Too. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay, this would be really interesting because that would be a nice side project to do to see. Yeah, yeah. Um, how it would, would yes, work. Yes, yes. Please but, feel free know, to yeah. contact yeah. me, and we can we can talk about it more in detail. I, yeah, I, that I would, would be, be really glad. nice. Yes. So that that's that's a quick fix, and if you are interested in implementing, you know, um, you know, how uh, 
non-zero flood, you know, uh, no boundary mm -hmm. condition, uh, you know, we can definitely try to, you know, help you guys because, you know, we'd like to have that implemented too, so. Yeah, yes. yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. No, I think it's uh, what I kind of, because I started actually working with Prism SPF first, and then I kind of went to working with Moose mostly because it was, I could really easily uh, build my own boundary condition files. Mm -hmm. Um, I think that would be really because that's as the same way with Prism PF, where you can just you you can have a parameters file and so on. It's, and then you have this boundary boundary condition file where you actually define your own boundary condition. Um, mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. it makes it very user friendly. Yeah. Way, so most most uh, ha, you know had been under development for you know several years at three yeah, yeah. before this even started. So yeah. uh, you know. Now, uh, in terms of features, you know, we have, you know, maybe fewer, but in terms of efficiency, I think uh, um, mm -hmm. it's actually you know, pretty good. This is, yeah, yeah. this yeah. is very good. Because I think, so. I think Moose does not have expl explicit, and uh, even if they did, mm -hmm. it wouldn't be uh, fast because they, you know, this, but they, they give us, I guess, prisons, prison P of the edge is this uh, matrix free method. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> So in some applications, mm -hmm. it's actually pretty fast. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, by the way, uh, there was one more question. I said that the um, um, pushcart question was answered, but I mm -hmm. think the link that uh, Kubra put in wasn't exactly the link oh. uh, she wanted. It was actually Nero search instead of uh, 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 Google group search. So. Oh, um, so is this, sorry, I'm trying to figure out, I don't is know it mailgoogle.com restart search yeah. restart or something? So, so, so it was, a uh, question was how to, where was it? Um, I forgot the question. Regarding how the to restart. restart. How to, yeah, how to start from checkpoint. Oh, okay. Uh, Pushkar, are you still there? I think he is. Yes, yes, you are. Okay, yes. Um, you, I didn't mention this because I didn't really have a lot of time, but let me show you. I'm going to share my screen. Um, I'm trying to figure out which screen I'm sharing. Am I sharing? Are you seeing the finder? The, the finder? I'm trying to find, yeah, finder. Yeah, okay, great. Data promise it. Yeah, yeah, okay. So um, I'm going to go to applications, Alan Khan. And then you can see uh, there's these restart files. But basically this information, these files contain all the information that's needed to, re to uh, restart the simulation from the last time step. Um, and the, the idea of these files is that you, you will need them if you know, the simulation for some reason cannot be completed or if it crashed and you wanted to change some something or you want to you know you didn't have enough time for um, uh, you know in the, you're running something in the cluster and you run out of time um, so anyway you don't really have to worry about them uh, but if you actually look at uh, the restart uh, time it'll tell you what, It'll tell you what, uh, oh, I'm sorry, I'm just gonna do this on, uh, on the terminal. Uh, it'll tell you what time you're in and then what time it'll restart from. So the only thing that you need to do is uh, you go to the parameters file. Let's go to the actual parameters file. And you just edit um, in, you know, we could, you would just put it anywhere. You can just in the output perhaps, or, you know, we can just create a new section. Um, let's call this, you know, uh, restart section. Again, it's not, this is not necessary, uh, but I'm just gonna, just to make it look nice, to make it look organized. 
And then you would set, you can just set, um, set, and I think it's called, I think it's called, please don't, um, uh, maybe I should get it right if this is recorded. Uh, it's a setting called restart from checkpoints or something like that. Um, and then just set it. Set checkpoint condition. Set what? Set checkpoint condition. Is that like this? Uh, yes. Is it one word or is can, it two words? I have the line of the code if you want, I can share. Uh, yeah, yeah. That'd be great. But are you sure that's, this, that's the right one? I'm just going to make sure. Checkpoint. Ah, uh, no, it's this one. I think it's load from a checkpoint. Ah, uh, also, I just equals true. Shared the quote. Thank you. So if we just put this, so the default is false. So all this information is in the manual, um, specifically in the input file but you can just set it to default is false. So if you set it to true, next time you run the simulation, it'll start from that point, okay? Hope that's clear. Thank you, Kubra, too. Uh, but then as you can see, yeah, there's all these settings that you can do is uh, you can do for your checkpoints, you can also decide when to, how to space the checkpoints. You know, if you wanna do it like log spacing equals spacing, how, or you can just say how many checkpoints do you want, or you know, like or you want checkpoints at this particular time steps. You have all those options. 